helpful to another. Um, great, so um, uh, our next lecturer is Andre de Govea, who you probably know well at this point, um, also from Northwestern. This is a Northwestern heavy week. Um, and he is gonna tell us about neutrino mass models. And um, yeah, and I guess people can see his slides um, and take it away. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, now you get to listen to me and you can see me too, instead of just seeing the little black square. Uh, so my job is to tell you something about neutrino mass models. Uh, so these will be three lectures. It's today, tomorrow, and on Friday. Uh, I will try to be hanging out at the coffee breaks uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday. And I'll try to make a point of always going to the e-room in case you don't want to talk to me. Uh, if you do want to talk to me, you, you can show up at the e-room. And like I said, you know, so these would be three lectures on neutrino mass models. I have never lectured uh, like this before, so it'll be exciting. Uh, anyway, so uh, I have a couple of references here that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is a, a self-serving reference. Uh, I, I have a, a review paper on neutrino mass models in annual reviews that you can check out. For some reason that I can't remember, it's actually not in the archives, but you can find it on Spires and the usual stuff. The other thing I wanted to shout out for is uh, these uh, very, very nice TASI lectures by Scott Willenbrock uh, all the way back in 2004. It turns out I was lecturing at TASI at the same time as well, and, and he gave amazing lectures. And his write-up is very nice. He was actually not talking about neutrinos at all. He was talking about the standard model but he made a very nice point of talking about the different symmetries of the standard model. And uh, I, I think some of what I'll talk about will have some uh, uh, relation to that. And even if it has no relation to that, these are very, very nice uh, lectures, so I want people to uh, uh, take a look at that. Uh, I can also mention that there's uh, several books on neutrino physics. Uh, the most comprehensive one is the one by Junti and Kim, and they also talk a little bit about, or maybe a lot about, uh, um, neutrino mass models. So before we get started, I want to give you a sense of what I plan to talk about. And I do want to try to make these uh, uh, lectures as simple as possible. So uh, if you feel offended or if you feel like I'm going very, very slowly, you should let me know uh, by any means necessary. Uh, but, but my claim is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about fermions. and fermion masses. Because after all, this is, these are lectures on neutrino masses, and neutrinos are fermions, and we're talking about their masses. Then I'll also spend some time, and I'm hoping that I'll finish this today, I'll talk about fermion masses in the standard model, which is something we should all be very, very familiar with. And, uh, but I do want to present it from the, the from a particular perspective in a way that I want to convince you that understanding neutrino masses is something that we haven't done yet. And it's also an interesting thing to be thinking about. And then for the last of the time, we'll be talking about neutrino masses. And in particular, uh, there are two broad categories of neutrino masses. One is uh, Dirac neutrino masses, and the other one is Majorana masses. And what I'll be doing here is, uh, again, discussing this more or less broadly, and then discussing some models, and then also trying to make some, some connection to phenomenology, because ultimately I wanna to try to convince you that giving neutrinos a mass is a question that we need to try to address. Uh, it's also a question that you can't address only by doing a, a theory. So we also wanna to try to make connections to experiments as well. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is fermions. So let me change to the black. And this is a subject that uh, you all get to hear about a lot. You know, probably you heard about this in your first lecture in, in particle physics ever, or even before you were doing something like quantum field theory you probably got to learn about fermions when you're taking quantum mechanics and so on. And 
I want to try to introduce fermions, and I want to talk mostly about chirofermions, which is uh, something that's a very, very good match for neutrino physics. And it's also how the standard model works. And because I don't have a lot of time, I will start out with what we know, or which I assume everybody knows, which is the Dirac fermion. which has a Lagrangian, assuming it doesn't talk to anything that looks like this. And I will assume that that's something that everybody is 100% very, very familiar with. But I will go through this relatively slowly because I'll be walking towards something. And again, you know, uh, 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 if, if you know all of this, uh, you know, you, you can at least uh, you know, enjoy the fact that you'll be a super expert in everything that I plan to talk about. So Psi is my direct fermion. It's some four component object. It's also anti-commuting. That's what makes fermions exciting. And uh, again, uh, this is a field. So psi is a field and it's associated to particles. And in particular, if I have a Dirac fermion like that, for example, if I have the, the electron is represented or associated to an electron field, uh, the key thing that I will be mentioning a couple of times is uh, what are the particles associated to that? And it turns out that there are four particles. There's the particle and the antiparticle. And every one of those has a, a, a two spin components. I'm only talking about spin a half fermions. I'm not going to be talking about spin three halves fermions or even more complicated things uh, because we don't know of any of those in the real world. We speculate about them in uh, other theories like uh, uh, supergravity, there's supposed to be a spin three halves particle, but I'm not going to talk about that at all. So this has a uh, particle and antiparticle, and then it has a spin up and a spin down. So one of these Dirac fermions uh, uh, describes four observable degrees of freedom. That's one thing. Let me also remind you very quickly what psi bar means. That means a psi gamma zero. Let me remind you very quickly what del slash means. That means this. And these gammas are the uh, Dirac matrices, Dirac gamma matrices. that obey some uh, Clifford algebra. Okay, so again, this is stuff that everybody knows, and I, whoops, thank you. So I think it's correct now, so yeah. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, the only thing which is very important is, uh, I want to work my way talk, towards talking about chirofermions. So that means I want to pick a particular representation uh, for the gamma matrices, which is called, and let me do that on the next page. Uh, this is the Cairo or Vio representation for these gamma matrices. And they look like this. And you know, these sigma i are the poly matrices. So this is in the representation where all of the gamma matrices are uh, completely off diagonal, except for uh, the fifth one. So one thing that everybody knows, if you're living in four dimensions, you can define gamma five, which is this. And this uh, gamma five business, by the way, uh, 
there's an equivalent of that in any uh, uh, even number of space-time dimensions, and we're not going to care about that at all. Uh, the key thing about gamma phi is that it anti-commutes with everything. It uh, gamma phi squared is one. And in this uh, vial representation, this uh, actually is a diagonal matrix. Okay, so this is uh, something that again, I am assuming everybody's very, very familiar with. And uh, once we have gamma phi, uh, we can ask uh, what are the eigenstates of gamma phi? So we define what's called a, a left chiral field, which is an eigenstate of gamma phi with a minus sign. And there's also a right chiral field, which is an eigenstate of gamma phi with a plus sign like that. Okay? So of course, and this is the, the part where, again, a lot of this is just to set up the notation. But one thing, of course, is uh, if you stare at what gamma five looks like, which is uh, this thing here, and this works pretty well, it's kind of cool. Then it is, should be very obvious that psi left is some spinner that has a, a non-zero in the top two uh, components. So let me write it like that. And zero in the bottom two. And then of course, psi right is the same thing, except that it's only in the bottom uh, that you have a, a non-zero components. Okay? So is that very clear? So just to make things uh, very, very clear for us, these things here, this is some two component object. And this is also a two component object. And they're called vial spinners. Okay. And it should be obvious that in this representation, or, or in any representation, but in particular, let me do this in some other color because it's going to be kind of weird. So I can write psi. And this one I think is too thin. So let me go and do this one as a very, very generically, I, I can write it like that. Now, the point of doing this is to say that, uh, you know, you're, one thing that you probably remember from your particle physics class is that if you choose a different representation for these gamma matrices and you stare at the spinner, uh, uh, the top two components of the spinners mean something and the bottom two mean something else. So in some language, uh, in some representation, you know, the top two have something to do with the particle, the bottom two have something to do with the antiparticle. Uh, in this particular representation, if I take my four component Dirac fermion, the top two components have something to do with this uh, uh, left chiral spinners, and the bottom two components have something to do with the right chiral spinners. And that's just a way of uh, thinking about your Dirac fermion, which for us will turn out to be uh, very, very useful for the things that I want to talk about. So again, uh, the other objects which are very important and uh, we will come back to lots of times are these vial spinners. Okay, so let me continue. So of course, once I've defined that, I can write my Lagrangian using these uh, two component vial spinners. Oh, I forgot something, so sorry about that. One thing which I will do here in some other color is uh, there's a, a fun thing you can do. Well, I don't have any swell, I, I can do it here. Is I can define my gamma mu. So if I look at these definitions of my gamma matrices, I can write it this way. So I can define a, a, a four vector out of the gamma matrices where the, the time component of the four vectors, the identity matrix. 
the annoying thing is this sign here. So that means that I have actually two different gamma matrices, one that looks like this, one and the poly matrices, and the other one that looks like one and minus the poly matrices. Okay, and again, uh, this should be more or less straightforward. The reason I'm talking about this is that I want to rewrite my Lagrangian using these uh, biospinners because I can, and it's a very trivial exercise. But it's a very useful exercise. It kind of looks like that. Okay, and uh, for, for people who like more sophisticated things, there's a lot of uh, stuff here that's kind of fun to look at. And uh, one is uh, these uh, vial spinners are strongly related with uh, lambdas that uh, Donald talked about in the very first week. There are these two component uh, spinners. Uh, one thing that you can notice here, for example, if you look at uh, like this kinetic energy terms, they give you the hint that if I take something like a, a two component spinner, a gamma matrix, a, a poly matrix, and, uh, and another spinner, I make something that looks like a four vector, which is again related to what, you, uh, that, what Donald talked about. And of course, we don't want to care about any of that. I do want to pause here and I want to say, why do we care about? Vio fermions. And uh, there are a couple of uh, very important things, and uh, I'm not going to prove many of those, but I'll just talk about them. And uh, these are things that you may have heard of, uh, and if you didn't hear about them, uh, I encourage you to look at that. The thing which is most important is uh, these guys. These are the irreducible representations, irreducible. Spin a half representations of the Lorentz group. So if you went through the exercise of identifying all of the irreducible representations of the Lorentz group, the spin a half ones are actually these two component objects. The Dirac fermion, which Dirac wrote down in the, you know, very long time ago in the 1920s, that's actually a reducible representation of the Lorentz group. It's very easy to see why it's a reducible representation here. Remember I said my Dirac fermion is made out of this thing and this thing. And the thing which is most important is if I take this guy and I do a Lorentz transformation, I end up with another thing that is also uh, one of these guys. It's also a right-handed chiral field. And the same thing goes for the left-handed one. Okay, and it's in that sense that the representation is reducible if you start out with a Dirac fermion, is that I can come up with, I can break it up into two pieces and every piece transforms onto another one of its kind under a, a Lorentz transformation. That means that a Lorentz transformation does not mix uh, uh, right chiral fermions with left chiral fermions. So in some sense, these are interesting fermions to think about if, uh, if, if, if all that you care about is uh, understanding irreducible representations of the Lorentz group. Uh, there's a nice way of picturing this, which is uh, some, something which I'll just say the words. So the, the Lorentz group, uh, is kind of like an SO3 comma 1. If you're very picky, that's not completely true, but it's pretty true. So let's pretend it's totally true. And this is equal to, and this is a, a, an equal sign that doesn't mean exactly equal to, but it's equal to for many purposes, uh, SU2 cross SU2. 
And it's in that sense uh, that these guys uh, 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 are, are easy to understand because this is a, a, a non-trivial spin a half representation of one of the SU2s. And this one is also a, a spin a half representation, but it's a spin a half representation under the other SU2. That's why under a Lorentz transformation, they transform amongst themselves, the lefts with the lefts and the rights with the rights. Okay, so that's the, that, that's the main idea here. Okay, so that's one comment about this. So why else do I care about uh, uh, biofermions? The rest of the, the, the other reason that we care about biofermions a lot is that if you look at the kinetic energy terms, so it's these terms here, the kinetic energy term uh, contains either only the C fields or the chi fields. It doesn't mix the, the, the Xs with the chi fields. That's not true of the mass term. So, so the mass term uh, mixes the right-handed chirofermion with the left-handed chirofermion. And this is something that you probably learned about. Uh, I'm sure that you learned about this. This is something that uh, people have been talking about for a long time. For example, if we had a gauge theory and these uh, fields were charged, so what we would do is to change this into a covariant derivative here, like that. And you notice that even in the gauge transformations, uh, the gauge interactions also don't mix uh, the right-handed chirofermions with the left-handed chirofermions. It's the mass term that kind of gets in the way. So one uh, thing that people really pay a lot of attention to because it makes your life easier is that in the massless limit, the chi particle and the psi particle, they kind of a disconnect. Which means that in the massless limit, uh, it is easier and better and more accurate to think about the chi particle and the psi particle as, as different particles, which are completely unrelated to one another, at least in principle. And this is exactly true in the massless limit. So here's a really dumb question. Uh, is a statement about R going to R under Lorentz transformations, is that still true when there's mass? Yes, uh, this is a property of the field. So that means if I take this field and uh, I perform a Lorentz transformation on it, uh, that's how it transforms. Now, the mass term mixes those two, but I can still define a Lorentz transformation of the field itself. Uh, so that's, uh, that's not a dumb question, but, but I think the answer is relatively straightforward. Uh, what the mass does is that it makes it uh, uh, more complicated or, 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 more, or less trivial to talk about the particles. So as far as the fields are concerned, you can always talk about the right chiral field and the left chiral field. When there's a mass term, what happens is that the left chiral field and the right chiral field pair up and the particles that you can produce and destroy, uh, they are gonna be produced and destroyed by combinations of those two fields. And I'll talk about this a lot. So, so hopefully this, this will become a little bit less confusing. So hopefully that was clear. Okay, so uh, going back to the massless limit, in the massless limit, it is fair to talk about the chi particle and the xi particle as different particles. And first of all, uh, uh, that's kind of interesting, uh, if nothing else. Uh, the other thing is that for practical purposes, this is a very powerful thing to think about because we often do high energy experiments. And if you're doing a high energy experiment, the mass is not very important. So whenever you're in a regime where the mass is not so important, you can treat uh, uh, the left chirofermions and the right chirofermions as if they were completely disconnected entities. So that's another uh, uh, good reason to care about biofermions. And in the strict massless limit, like I said, those two uh, objects here disconnect. And of course, when I say that they disconnect is that they can be associated to particles that are not naively related to one another. So for example, if I take here the chi L field, 
what it will do is it will be associated to two particles. And one of those particles is a left helicity particle. and a right helicity antiparticle. And these particles really are a particle-antiparticle pair. Okay, and again, uh, because we're in the massless limit, uh, spin up and spin down don't make sense anymore, but helicity does. And, uh, and it turns out that the Sakai L field Every time it produces a particle, uh, uh, it must produce a, a, a particle of the left-handed helicity variety. And every time it produces an antiparticle, the antiparticle will be of the right-handed helicity uh, variety. Okay? The same thing will happen for the other guy, for the chi right, the xi right. And it will be exactly the same, except that uh, these things are flipped. Okay, so that's the, that's the only difference between those two. And if you've been paying attention to neutrino physics, this is very, very much like what neutrinos are like. So if you think about neutrinos, neutrinos are kind of like this guy. And we're pretty familiar with that. You know, when, if you ignore the effect of neutrino masses, which for the vast majority of experiments we've ever done is a great approximation because neutrino masses are super small. So again, hopefully that's come across from Kate's lectures and Alex's lectures from last week and the previous week. Uh, this is kind of how neutrinos are. You know, every time you, you produce a neutrino, neutrinos are always left-handed. And every time you produce an antineutrino, antineutrinos are always right-handed. So, uh, that's the that's the other reason that we care about uh, biospinners. The final reason we care about biospinners is that the standard model is made out with uh, you know chiral fermions. or saying this in a more uh, sophisticated way, uh, the standard model is a chiral gauge theory. Okay, so hopefully this is all uh, uh, incredibly simple and very, very clear for everybody. So now that we've gotten this far, uh, let's try to make things a little bit more complicated just for fun. And uh, this is also something that is a very, very common to do. And what happens is, if we wanna talk about fermions, we have two kinds of fermions. These are left-handed biofermions that I was talking about, and these right-handed chirofermions that I was talking about. It turns out that that's, that's too much work. We don't wanna care about left-handed chirofermions and right-handed chirofermions. We wanna just care about one kind of those. Uh, let's not care about, say, the right-handed ones. The question is, can I use up only, can I write down all of my Lagrangians and everything using only left-handed chiral fermions? And it turns out that the answer is yes. So uh, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, and this is also something that you learned in your particle physics class, but it might be among the things that you've forgotten because uh, only people who care about neutrinos uh, uh, usually talk about this. It turns out you can define uh, the charge conjugate of your Dirac fermion. And the charge co conjugate looks like some number, which I'll, I'll mention what it is in just a second, gamma zero, some other matrix C, M psi star. <clears throat> this is something that turns out to be very useful if you wanna write down uh, the Dirac equation for the positron as opposed to the Dirac equation for the electron. So you use this a uh, charge conjugate field. So we can look at uh, the entities that make up this thing here. This is called uh, the charge parity. Actually, I'll, I'll use the wrong name. 
it's a number which is either plus or minus one for our, for our purposes. It's actually a phase which, which we don't care about. It's what happens when you go from the particle to the antiparticle. Uh, some fields are associated with a plus sign, other fields are associated with a minus sign. Then there's this gamma zero C. So this C here, which is meant to be a fancy C, for our purposes, it looks like this, which I wrote this down and it looks like this. Okay, so this is the, the charge conjugation matrix. Okay, so again, uh, there's this charge conjugate, you know, there's this pointing at the screen doesn't work. So I can define this other fermion here, which is also a Dirac fermion. It's not special, but it's related to the one that we started with uh, by charge conjugation multiplied by some junk. Okay. So in the bases that we're interested in, uh, I can write down what this object is. So this object looks like, so psi c is minus eta c. And again, this is just a multiplying matrices together. And it looks like minus i sigma 2 And that's what that looks like. Okay, so I want to not care about, or, or let me not say that, or let, let me do the following. This of course is a, a Dirac spinner in the basis that we're writing about. So whatever this Dirac spinner is, so let me write down a reminder that a psi is a, was chi left, psi right. So this spinner here is the same in the sense that the upper two components are a left-handed vial spinner. So let me give it a name. I'll call it a chi c left. And the bottom two are a right-handed uh, bio spinner as well. Okay. So this is the this is the thing which is very very important. So if we stare here, we notice that minus i sigma two chi r star is the left-handed component of my uh, uh, charge conjugate field. So from here, I can turn this around and I can solve for chi for the right-handed uh, vial spinner and that's I sigma two chi LC star. Okay. So again, I do wanna emphasize the C here just to let us know. So this C here, is the same as this C here, just to let us know that this is associated with some charge conjugate field. Okay, and of course, if I make a connection of that to the direct fermion that I started with, then this is the connection. So the key thing is that I can associate this right-handed chiral fermion here to a left-handed chiral fermion that lives in the charge conjugate field, and they're associated in this way through this, uh, a very, very useful equation like that. So the bottom line is that instead of working with this uh, psi right field, I can choose to work with a left-handed field of a different fermion, okay? So hopefully that's kind of clear. Okay, so if you buy that, that means that I can write down, oh, how do I do this here? I can write down my fermion as a left-handed fermion and the charge conjugate 
of another left-handed fermion. Okay, and then when I, yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, the, okay, yeah, so that's, so the answer, so the question is, the chi C is still not directly related to chi at this point besides the notation, right? Right, that's completely right. And uh, I will write down a Lagrangian that involves chi and chi C, and uh, that will become uh, uh, a little bit more uh, uh, clear. The key thing here is that both chi and chi C are left-handed vial spinners. And because they're both left-handed, I don't have to write the left index anymore. It's implied. Okay, so henceforth, all of the two component fermions will be left-handed, unless I say otherwise. Okay? So again, the idea is there is a, there is a hidden L, which I'm not going to write down. Okay? So what do I gain if I do that? What happens is I can rewrite my Lagrangian, and you should do the exercise yourself. It will look like this. So that's the kinetic energy piece. And then the mass term will look like this. And I'm going to write it uh, in this very cumbersome way. And just to be clear, this term here, that's just a permission conjugate of the first term. So I'm not going to keep writing that term back again. But we do want to pay attention to this term over here. OK, so before I talk about this term, uh, let me just address the comment that was made here again. And this is the important part. If I stare at this Lagrangian, it looks like the kinetic energy term for some left-handed vial fermion chi, the kinetic energy term for another completely unrelated vial fermion chi sub c, which is also a left-handed vial fermion. Uh, and as far as those two lines here are concerned, there's no hint that chi and chi c have to be related in any way, shape, or form. Now, the mass term does relate chi C and chi in this uh, non-trivial way, just like the mass term used to relate chi left and chi right. Okay, so it's in this way that chi C and chi are going to be related to one another. And again, if the mass term were not there, chi and chi C would be completely unrelated, and this would be the proper Lagrangian of a massless Dirac fermion. Okay. So now let's go back to this mass term. And uh, we can identify what this mass term is as uh, uh, something very, very straightforward, which is the following. So again, remember, this chi is a two-component thing. It's a spinner. So it has two components. So let me write it as a chi up and chi down. The same is true for chi c. That's also a chi c up and a chi c down. Now, this up and down has nothing to do with uh, um, spin up or spin down or anything like that. It's just to differentiate the top component from the bottom component. OK, so let's look at what this thing here is. Chi c transpose i sigma 2 chi that looks like the following. So the key thing that we want to remember is uh, up to a sign, which I have no hope of ever keeping track of. I sigma 2 is a matrix that looks like this, up to a sign. So I'll put a proportionality number um, thing over here. 
Okay, so if we keep that in mind and we work this out, this looks like chi C up, chi down minus chi C down, chi up. Okay, and this is what a mass term looks like. And if you think about this, this is what a mass term should look like. Oh, so there was a question here, which is what's the connection between this way of writing things versus dotted and undotted notation uh, with the Lebesgue the symbol. Uh, it is completely related. And uh, I, I, I can talk about this a little bit. And uh, what happens is, uh, give me one second and, and I'll come back and talk about this if you don't mind. But yeah, it, it's exactly the same. And, and the key thing, of course, you can see here, if you remember from Donald's uh, lectures, this thing here, is this uh, epsilon alpha beta, right? So that's, that's kind of the whole point. So that's the, that's the key thing. And coming back to, that, uh, to, that, to what I was talking about here, so this is uh, what my mass term looks like in this language. And this is kind of what you expect. Because again, remember, uh, we like to say that these chi's, oops, sorry about that. These chi's belong to some SU2, right? They are uh, like, a, like a, a, a two component object. And of course, if I give you two of those, and I ask you to make a spin zero, the way that you would make a spin zero is exactly like that, right? So what we're doing is I'm, I'm, I'm giving you two spin a half objects of the quantum mechanics variety, you know, the stuff that you learn in undergraduate quantum mechanics. And I say, here, here are the two spin a half things. I need you to make a spin zero thing because that's the thing that's allowed to go in the Lagrangian. So if you do that, this is the only object that you can construct. Right, so this, so that means that mass terms look like that. Now, these combinations show up a lot when you're using two component fermions. And they show up so much that we define a dot product. So this thing here, so let me point. So this object here is defined to be a chi C chi with a dot here. And as you know, normally we're very lazy, so we don't write down the dot. If you're very fancy, as people were asking about these uh, alpha alpha dot indices, you can write it like that. And if you want to be very explicit, this is also epsilon alpha beta chi c alpha chi beta. And hopefully this is visible. Okay, so, so again, if you have never heard about this before and you want to get a quick picture in your mind of what's going on, what's going on is the following. We're taking our four component Dirac fermion, we're splitting it up into two uh, uh, spinners, two two component spinners, and we're just saying that the mass term that we get to write down is the spin zero combination of those two component spinners. Okay. So I hope that this is kind of clear. And uh, let me make a quick aside because people asked about this uh, uh, two component notation uh, with, uh, with the dotted and undotted indices. The way that people like to talk about this is the following. So, and I'll be very brief. So we have this, uh, so this is a parenthesis. So, we can write down the left-handed spinner. We can refer to its components like that. So alpha equals one, two. Remember we had the right-handed one. And in order to uh, remember that the left-handed part of the uh, Lorentz group is different from the right-handed part of the Lorentz group, we give this guy a different 
index. So we, we, we use an alpha with a dot. So alpha dot is also equals to one, two. Sometimes people put a bar here, and that's to really remind themselves that these things are different. Oh, by the way, yes, th that's correct. So I remember I said chi and chi c anti-commute, so they're Grassmann numbers. And I will remind you of that in just a second as well. So this is this uh, two component notation. And the key thing is that complex conjugation changes you from a left-handed spinner to a right-handed spinner. So it kind of goes like this. If I calculate the complex conjugate of that, I get this, and people like to write a bar that way. And of course, as I mentioned, I have this uh, epsilon alpha beta chi beta that defines me uh, a chi with the index down. And if you buy into all of this, then when I write down my fermion, so let me give myself some room here. So my fermion, if I got this correctly, kind of looks like, I wrote this here, chi alpha, and this will be chi c bar alpha dot, like that. And some people really live by this notation as well. Okay, we're not gonna care about this at all. All that I wanna care about, the reason I'm talking about all of this is to tell you that um, if I have two vial spinners, so again, remember everybody here is left-handed now. And believe it or not, this is meant to be a zeta, not a, so, so this thing here, is a different Greek letter from this one. And if you live long enough, you actually get to be good at drawing them differently, which I claim I know how to do, but don't, don't test me on that. So if I have two left-handed biospinners, uh, I can construct these uh, uh, Lorentz invariant bilinears out of them just by combining them in the way that I've been describing. So if I write this down, the key thing is that this is a Lorentz invariant. And if I were to write this in a Lagrangian, so this is something that I could put a mass here. Well, probably I can put a mass here and I add Hermitian conjugate. Actually, not like that. Uh, just to be super picky. The mass doesn't have to be a real number. At least its mass parameter doesn't have to be real. And this would be a term that looks uh, that you could find inside of a Lagrangian. Okay. So that's the that's the key point, and there's nothing very spectacular about this, except for the fact that uh, you actually have more choices now. So. The reason uh, I'm talking about this is that you can now ask a different question, which is, what if I calculate this, for example, or this? And just like what we were writing down before, this looks like chi up, chi down, minus chi down, chi up. And this is where one of the comments comes in, which is, uh, uh, this is not zero because these chi's anti-commute. Actually, that's not what I went to write. So one of these is wrong. Should be add down. Okay, so because these things anti-commute, uh, it turns out that just like I can form a bilinear of two fermions by taking the product of two of these things, I can do the same thing by multiplying the field with itself. This one here would be the same. Zeta up, zeta down, minus zeta down, zeta up. 
This is also not zero because these things also anti-commute. Okay, so if you've been following everything so far, this means that there are two kinds of masses. There's something called a Dirac mass. And that's the term which is associated with the product of two fields which are different. And then there's something called a Majorana mass. which is uh, made out with uh, a field multiplied by itself. Okay, so there's a question. And, and let me uh, uh, remind people that if you wanna ask a question, you might profit from making sure that all panelists and attendees can see the question so everybody gets to read it. So there are actually two questions, I'll read both of them. So the Dirac field is written in this formalism using only left-handed fields. And then the right-handed parts are just left-handed fields conjugates. Yes, absolutely. So that means that every time there's a right-handed uh, vial spinner, I can think about that as the complex conjugate of a left-handed one. And then the other question is, could you repeat the definition of zeta? Is it related to chi C? Good, yes, I, I should have been more clear. Uh, I was being very, very general. I was just saying, if I gave you two different left-handed vial fermions, and I asked you to write down uh, something that's Lorentz invariant out of those two left-handed fermions, the dot product of the two of them in this way that I've been talking about. Uh, that would be uh, 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 this, this dot product here, that would be a Lorentz invariant thing. So this could have been chi C. Uh, so hopefully that was less, less confusing. Okay. To be just precise about notation, are there any complex conjugations that we need to put into the dot products? No, absolutely not. So that's a great question. So if all of your objects are left-handed vial fermions, your mass term is the product of two uh, pure left-handed chiral fermions. There's no complex conjugation. There is complex conjugation here. So your Lagrangian has to be real as well, Hermitian. Uh, so that means that every time you have a term, you have to add the, the, the complex conjugate to it. But, but that's, that's a great point, and this is something to keep in mind. That's, by the way, why this notation is so nice. And it reminds me of the next thing that I wanted to say, which is the following. Uh, so again, you can write down everything in terms of uh, these are left-handed vial fermions. You can throw away all of the right-handed vial fermions. One question you're allowed to ask, so I, I guess I can, no, this is too busy. I can make a quick comment about why would anybody want to do this, right? So what's the advantage of expressing everything in terms of left-handed vial fermions instead of both left-handed fermions and right-handed fermions? So why left only? There are lots of answers to this. Uh, one is that it makes your life a little bit easier in some sense. And there's a lot of things which are much easier to write down and understand if all of your fermions are left-handed vial fermions. Uh, historically, there's one example that's very well known, which is guts. When you talk about things like SO10 grand unified theories or SO10, I'm sorry, SO10 grand unified theories or SU5 grand unified theories, uh, and you wanna ask how do the different fermions in the standard model match up in terms of some bigger representation of SO10 or SU5, uh, this works out very well if all of your fermions have the same chirality. If you have fermions of different chiralities, uh, it is much more cumbersome to fit them together into the right representations. Of course, you can do it because you use complex conjugations and whatnot, but it, everything jumps out at you much more straightforwardly uh, if you're using left-handed vial fermions only. Of course, the other thing which some of you might be very, very familiar with is supersymmetry. When you say that in supersymmetry, or when you perform a supersymmetry transformation, you transform uh, a fermion into a boson, for example, a fermion into a scalar, 
that means that they form a, a, a multiplet or, or a super multiplet. And, uh, and, and the object which is associated with uh, uh, the scalar is a left-handed chiral fermion. And the object that's associated, for example, to a gauge boson is also a, a left-handed chiral fermion. Uh, so the next question is, but doesn't the standard model also have fewer right-handed fields? Yes, it does. And the question is, how do we do that? We can get rid of them by working with their uh, charge conjugate fields. And I will do that probably in, in, in about five minutes. So uh, hopefully that will be a little bit more clear. Okay. And uh, one thing that's very interesting, if you do care about supersymmetry, is uh, you learn about the superpotential and supersymmetry. And uh, it has to be a holomorphic function of your fields. And also, if you express all of your fields in terms of uh, 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 left chiral fields, uh, that, that statement is, is easier to work with. So I, I will leave, leave it at that. Okay, so before I talk about the standard model, uh, the thing which I think is most important to appreciate is the fact that, uh, remember I said that the direct fermion, so this sub psi is reducible. Chi is not. And again, you know, this is a, a direct spinner. This is a vial spinner. There's one interesting question you can ask, which is if I only have this guy, can I write down a Lagrangian for that? And uh, there's a question which I'll come back to in just a second. So let me just write down uh, the Lagrangian for this guy by itself. And it kind of looks like this. So remember I said that terms that look like this, that's a kinetic energy term. So again, this is a proper kinetic energy term for a vial field. And then if I want to give it a mass, I can just add and it is a useful to write down this factor of a half here. And the reason you write this factor of a half is just like what happens with a, with a real scalar field. When you write down the mass term and the kinetic energy term for that, uh, there's a factor of a half because you want the mass that's written here in the Lagrangian to be the same mass that shows up in the kinetic energy term. It, sorry, the same mass that shows up in the equation of motion. So it's the thing that you call the mass of the particle. Okay, so the question in the chat is, why does the charge complex conjugate of a left-handed spinner give a right-handed spinner? Is this because the Lorentz algebra generators look like J minus IK and J plus IK? Uh, I think it's related to that. Uh, I, I don't wanna, I, I won't get into the details, but basically what you wanna do is to write down the, the Lorentz transformation for uh, some object chi and then you write down, uh, if you start out with that, and then you take the complex conjugate of that entire equation, that will, that will give you a hint as to how the complex conjugate field transforms. You kind of have to undo the, 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 the transpose, but once you do that, you can do this, and then you check that it looks like that. So the other question is, uh, should it be minus i in the kinetic energy term? Uh, I, I didn't think so, but I'm, I am very, very cavalier about signs. So if you think it's minus i, you go, out, go with the minus i. In my notes, it's plus, but, but that's as far as I want to go with that. Other question. And yes, uh, and should the derivative be to the right? Oh, yeah. So I wrote this very messily. Uh, I, so, okay, so if people want to be very picky, I think you definitely can write it this way. These things are all related because you can do, uh, that's why, oh, maybe that's why people are asking about a minus sign. So this looks like this. Is that better? I think that's better. And again, remember, you can always do integrations by parts 
and you can throw out uh, total derivatives. And maybe that's why somebody was worried about a minus i instead of a plus i. Okay, is, is that more clear? Okay, good. So anyway, so the reason I'm talking about this is I wanna say that if you wanted to start studying fermions, this is probably the Lagrangian you would like to have started with, other than the Dirac Lagrangian, because this one has fewer degrees of freedom, okay? And that's the key thing to think about. Now, there's a very important thing, which is this uh, mass term is the product of chi with itself. But remember that this chi uh, describes two degrees of freedom. So if we're staring at this Lagrangian, what this thing here does is that it describes some object that has a, a spin a half, let's say, oh, sorry, one degree of freedom is a spin up object, and the other one is a spin down object. And of course, we, we all know about antiparticles. So, so this field in some sense doesn't have any, which is wrong. Uh, it just means that the antiparticle is the same as the particle. So this is kind of like a, a, a real scalar field. So if you have a real scalar field and you have a, a particle, there is an antiparticle which is the same as the particle, like, like the pi zero. So in terms of uh, degrees of freedom, this chi field that has this uh, Lagrangian there describes two degrees of freedom. There's mass. So that means that you can go into the rest frame of the particle that you can produce. And then there are two of them, a, a spin up and a spin down. And they can be rotated into one another by some Lorentz transformation. OK? So hopefully this will become a little bit more clear. OK. So I just wanted to say that, and okay, okay, okay. Oh yeah, and then finally, one very important comment, which is uh, if all of this sounds very, very confusing for you, and you say, I really don't like working with these two component spinners, I think it's too messy. I want to do. I want to do better. I only want to work with Dirac spinners or four component spinners. Uh, you can do that. So there's two. Okay. So so, so let me ask. So uh, Heather says, "Am I using the metric which is one minus minus minus?" Yes, absolutely. I hope that didn't make a difference at any point yet. But yes. And then the other question is, what are the two degrees of freedom in the massless limit? In the massless limit, the two degrees of freedom, in quotes, are still the same. Uh, in the massless limit, so if you don't have a mass, so imagine that that term were not there. And I shouldn't have scratched it out like that, so let's not do that. So if that were not there, so imagine this is scratched out, uh, I would still have two degrees of freedom. In that case, I would have to talk about uh, uh, helicity states, there would be a left helicity state and a right helicity state. And we could call them a particle-antiparticle pair, and that would be probably the best way of talking about that. And, and I'll come and talk about this in the case of neutrinos as well. So finally, the, there are a couple of other questions. Uh, okay, I see. So uh, I, I am being warned that you should not take any of my signs seriously, so that's important. Ah, good. So that's the, so uh, let, me, let me just answer. So, the, so there are two questions. One question is, in the massless limit, uh, again, there are only two degrees of freedom. Remember, my chi is a left chiral state. Okay, I'm sorry. Chi is a left chiral field. And that means uh, uh, in the normal language that we use, we say that it, uh, destroys a left chiral state in the massless limit. And then it has an antiparticle, which is a right helicity particle. For all practical purposes, all that we care about is that it can create a left helicity state or a right helicity state. And we say that those form a particle antiparticle pair. And uh, so again, uh, chi is a left chiral field. And because it's a left chiral field, 
uh, it produces particles which are all left helicity. But it also has the thing that we normally call the antiparticle, which is right helicity. And uh, I will try to say this again in words when we're talking about neutrinos, and maybe that will be a little bit more clear. So finally, there's another question, which is, does right-handed spinner have the same charge as a left-handed spinner? The answer is, uh, we haven't talked about charge at all. Oh, and actually, I, and I forgot to talk about something. But I will say this now. So that's a very good, that's a very good question. The question is, how do the charges of these right-handed spinners and left-handed spinners relate to one another? The answer is, we don't know. Uh, in principle, they're not related at all. And if they're not, and depending on how they are related to one another, that allows or prevents you from writing down different terms in the Lagrangian. So again, uh, uh, the message is, if we choose to only work with these vial spinners, remember I can make them all left-handed, they're all unrelated to one another, which means that I can give them any charge that I like, but once I've given them different charges, I can then go back to my Lagrangian and ask, okay, once I've given all these charges to all of these particles, what are the terms in the Lagrangian that I can write down? And then once you write down all of these different terms in the Lagrangian, then you go back and then you ask, are these fields related to one another in some way that I didn't know before? And then you go back and you talk about that. So, uh, more questions. Uh, one is, all my chi's are left-handed vial spinners. And the question is, should there be a chi transpose somewhere? And the answer is no, uh, not in this Lagrangian that's in the box here. Remember, there's a chi dagger there, which includes a transpose. It's not the complex conjugate, it's the dagger. And then every time I write down something that looks like this, it is implied that these are two spin a half particles which have been dotted into one another uh, uh, using that epsilon symbol. Does that make sense? So yeah, so that's the other question, which is uh, there is a, a dot here, which tells me in which way those two chi's are multiplied together. And the way that, that one way that you can always think about this is, uh, as I was writing down before, is that uh, you can write down one chi this way. This is the up component and the down component. The other one is right, written down this way, the same thing. And then this product here means take this one, multiply by that one, and subtract off this one, multiply by that one. And that's all included in this, uh, uh, in this symbol here. So uh, we will talk about this later. So there's another comment. Even though chi and psi have different choices of charges, it seems we can always generate the mass term and the Lagrangian by having a Higgs field. And that's what I'll talk about next, but that's completely correct. So I'm just trying to, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be as general as possible uh, before we start talking about the standard model. Okay, so let me go back and, and oh, do I wanna do that? One thing which I forgot to say, which is very important. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna say it now, I'll, I'll say it later when it comes up again. Okay, uh, the last thing which I wanted to say, which is related to these is uh, you can define it. If I only have one of these chi's, I can still define a four component object, which is made out of chi and I sigma two, chi star. So remember, chi is a left-handed left -handed object, and I sigma 2 chi star is a right-handed object. So this, is the, the, this has the right rules for a Dirac spinner, except it has fewer degrees of freedom because it's only made out of chi. So this is often called a Majorana, a Majorana four-component spinner. So I can re-express everything in this way. And in particular, my mass term, I don't know how this happened. Okay, that's better. So my mass term will include something that looks like one half 
m, which is the same m that lives there, and then it would be something like a psi c bar psi, where psi c is the is the charge conjugate field associated to this one. Okay, and because nobody ever remembers how to write down psi c given psi, and because all of these Lagrangians look very ugly with the psi c, that's why nobody really likes to talk about this. So I'm not going to talk about this. But you can do everything using four component uh, Majorana fermions. Now the next question is about uh, gauge couplings. So the, the key thing, and that's, that's what I'll start introducing now because I only have uh, about five minutes. Uh, but I'll talk about gauge interactions. The key thing is to always remember. So once you have an object in your theory, so let, uh, once I have this object in my theory, I can assign it some charge under some gauge symmetry. And then if I promote this derivative here to a covariant derivative, which is what I did uh, fictitiously there, then the information about the charge will tell me how this thing interacts. So all of the gauge interactions live in this, in this piece of the Lagrangian here. So I don't have any doubts about how to write that. So the, the last question is, could you please remind us where we drop the chi sub C? Should the mass term in the box look like that? And the answer is no. So again, remember, we were asking if I only had the chi field. And remember, this a chi C field, that's a different field. Okay, it's a different object. So the question I'm asking is, can I write down, so this is an object that does not exist in the theory that I'm trying to write down. So it's there, it's gone. So I can even erase it like that. So if this object does not exist, can I still write down a Lagrangian? And the answer is yes. And that's the, the most general Lagrangian that I can write down. Okay, so in the next few minutes, uh, I wanna just uh, start, and, and the reason I wanna write this down, and this is what we'll start with uh, next time, is hopefully that will get people thinking about certainly some of the questions that people were asking. And that's just uh, talking about fermions in the standard model. Now the standard model has a lot of fermions, lots and lots and lots of fermions. It actually has a 15 times three fermions. So let me write them down. Uh, so there's a nice, these are all of the fermions in the standard model. And uh, remember, I want all of them to be uh, two component vial fermions, which are left-handed. So in order to do that, let me put some C's here. And remember, this C is just part of the name of the fermion. Okay, so this is the, the famous acutely. It's a good mnemonic device if you, if you ever have to remember all of these here. And all of these fermions are charged under the standard model gauge group. And I just want to do this and then I'll stop because this is stuff that you guys probably know. Uh, but if you don't know, we'll go back and talk about this again. So again, this Q is a doublet. So let me remind it. it's made out of an up and a down. So it's a two of SU2. The L is also a doublet. It's made up of a neutrino and a charged lepton. So it's also a two under SU2. And all these other guys are singlets. Okay, the L and the E don't have any color. So this is the color gauge group. So they don't have any color there. And then the Q is a, is a triplet of color, as everybody knows. And then this guy, UC and DC, because I'm writing them as left-handed fields, not right-handed fields, left-handed fields, they're actually anti-color. They're, they're anti-triplets, they're three bars, okay? And then finally, we have to write down the hypercharges. So 
this is one sixth. This one here is minus a half. And then for these guys, the, 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 for the other three, the hypercharge is the same as the charge. And we remember that these are the, the left-handed particles, the left-handed partners of the right-handed particles. Or the, so anyway, this is plus one, this is plus a third, and this is minus two thirds. Okay, so again, in the language that, uh, you know, so hopefully this helps address some of the questions. You know, uh, uh, all of these objects here, they are like the chi's that I was writing down before. And they, they all transform under these gauge transformations with these types of charges. So that means that all of my derivatives, I can replace by covariant derivatives, okay? And this is a part which I don't wanna talk about at all because it's not purview of, of my lectures. The part which I do wanna talk about is how do these guys talk to each other in order to give me massive fermions at the end of the day? And of course, uh, as everybody knows, the, it, it's, a, it's a quick job to figure out that you can't write down any mass terms at all in your Lagrangian. And the only way that you can get around this is by having a Higgs boson. So this is what I'll start talking about. So the last thing I wanna to say today is uh, all of this is multiplied by three because of the families. And I will not talking about families at all for the most part. And Alisa is talking about this in the afternoon and she will tell you all about uh, what can we do and what happens when you have all these different generations. So I should probably stop here for now in case there are more questions. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, do people have more questions? You can either put them in the text chat or um, press the raise hand button in the in the participants list and I'll keep an eye on both. Oh, I have to click over to attendees so. though. Good, so uh, are we excluding neutrino from standard model? And uh, so I will be talking about neutrinos a lot. The neutrinos have not been excluded from the standard model, in, at least for now. They are right here. And uh, I, the, one of the first things I will say in the next lecture is that if you stare at this table, uh, you, you should convince yourself that the neutrino masses are zero. So that's what I wanna start from the next time. So the neutrinos are here, and we've been talking about this a standard model for, I don't know, 50 years or so. So yeah, they've always been there. The, the, the novelty is that their masses are not zero, and we have to figure out how to give them a mass. Great. Any other questions? Maybe there are, and people are still typing. Okay, I don't, I don't see any questions just now. Um, just a reminder that the uh, afternoon lecture starts at two, two o'clock TASI time. Um, and before that, starting at 1.30 TASI time will be the coffee break. And um, I believe Andre will be there in the room labeled E. And if you don't remember the link, uh, go to the Slack channel and it's in the general discussion. Um, as one of the pinned posts, the link for all of the coffee break rooms. Um, yeah, and, and if you have further questions, you can either stick them in the Slack or come to the coffee break and ask them there. And I guess we're done for now and see you all this afternoon. Well, thank you. So thank you, Andre.